chapter one of monte cristo's daughter this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg chapter one monte cristo and the prima donna the count of monte cristo was in rome he had hired one of the numerous private palaces the palazzo costi situated on a broad thoroughfare near the point where the ponte sant'angelo connects rome proper with that transtiberine suburb known as the leonine city or trastaviri the impecunious roman nobility were ever ready to let their palaces to titled foreigners of wealth and ali acting for the count had experienced no difficulty in procuring for his master an abode that even a potentate might have envied him it was a lofty commodious edifice built of white marble in antique architectural design and commanded from its ample balconies a fine view of the tiber and its western shore upon which loomed up that vast prison and citadel the castle of st angelo and the largest palace in the world the vatican the count of monte cristo had always liked rome because of its picturesque mysterious antiquity but his present mission there had nothing whatever to do with his individual tastes he had fixed himself for a time in the eternal city that his daughter zuleika Heyday's child might finish her education at a famous convent school conducted under the auspices of the sisterhood of the sacred heart zuleika was fifteen years of age but looked much older having the early maturity of the greeks whose ardent blood on her dead mother's side flowed in her youthful veins she had attained her full height and was tall and well developed she strongly resembled her mother possessing brilliant beauty of the dreamy voluptuous oriental type her hair was abundant and black as night she had dark flashing eyes pearly teeth full ruby lips and feet and hands that were of fairy-like diminutiveness as well as miracles of grace and dainty shapeliness in temperament she was more like heyday than the count though she possessed her father's quick decision and firmness with the addition of much of his enthusiasm the palazzo costi was magnificently furnished so the count had made no alterations in that respect bringing with him only the family wardrobe and a portion of his library consisting mainly of oriental manuscripts written in weird cabalistic characters and intelligible to no one but himself the household was made up solely of the count his son esperance his daughter zuleika the faithful nubian mute ali and five or six male and female domestics having no other object than his daughter's education the count wished to live in as thorough retirement as he could but it was impossible for him to keep his presence a secret and no sooner had it become known that he was in rome than he was besieged by hosts of callers belonging to the highest nobility mingled with whom came numerous patriots disciples of the unfortunate savonarola distinguished for their firm devotion to the cause of italian liberty at an early hour of the morning upon which this narrative opens the count of monte cristo sat alone in a small apartment of the palazzo costi which had been arranged as his study and in which his precious manuscripts were stored in closely locked cabinets the count had a copy of a roman newspaper before him and his eyes were fixed on a paragraph that seemed to have fascinated him as the serpent fascinates the bird the paragraph read as follows 
mademoiselle louise d'armilly the famous prima donna who will sing to-night at the apollo theatre her great role of lucrezia borgia has it appears a deep impenetrable mystery surrounding her she is french by birth and is said to be the daughter of a banker who vanished under peculiar circumstances but as she positively declines to speak of her history we can only give the rumours concerning her for what they are worth m leon d'armilly brother of the prima donna who supports her in donizetti's opera also refuses to be communicative at any rate the mere hint of the mystery has already caused quite a flutter of excitement in high society circles and that is sufficient to ensure a crowded house louise d'armilly murmured the count half audibly the name is familiar certainly though where i have seen or heard it before i cannot now recall the lady is french by birth the paper says and that fact at least is a sufficient pretext for me to visit her i will call on her as a fellow-countryman and the interview will demonstrate if she is known to me the count arose went to his desk and seating himself there wrote the following brief epistle edmond dantes count of monte cristo desires permission to call upon mademoiselle louise d'armilly at ten o'clock this morning in this desire m dantes is actuated solely by the wish to lay the homage of a frenchman at the feet of so distinguished an artiste of his own nation as mademoiselle d'armilly having finished sealed and addressed this note the count touched a bell which was immediately answered by the ever watchful nubian ali said the count in the arabic tongue take this letter to the hotel de france and wait for a reply the faithful servant bowed almost to the floor took the missive and departed when he had gone the count walked the apartment with the long strides habitual to him at such times as he was engrossed by some all-powerful thought surely he muttered this artiste can in no way interest me personally and yet i feel a subtle premonition that it would be wise in me to see her he was still pacing the study when ali returned the nubian's usually impassable face bore traces of excitement and horror he prostrated himself at his master's feet and with his visage pressed against the floor held up his hand presenting to the count the identical letter of which he had been the bearer why how is this ali asked the count frowning my letter sent back without an answer the seal has been broken too it must have been read the mute slowly arose and began an eloquent pantomime which his master readily translated into words you went to the hotel de france and sent up the letter in ten minutes it was returned to you by the lady's valet who said all the answer the count of monte cristo deserved from his mistress was written on the back ali nodded his head in confirmation of his master's translation looking as if he expected to be severely reprimanded for being the bearer of such an indignity the count however merely smiled curiosity rather than anger predominated in him he turned the letter over and read scrawled in pencil in a woman's hand the following brief and enigmatical but insulting communication any frenchman save the ignominious m dantes the so-called count of monte cristo would be welcome to mademoiselle d'armilly that person she does not wish to see and will not the count was perplexed and also amused the fervour of the prima donna made him smile he certainly did not know her certainly had never seen her why then was she so bitter against him he could make nothing out of it was it possible her name was really as familiar to him as it had seemed the irate artiste had surely heard of the count of monte cristo and therefore could not be mistaken in regard to his identity but in what way could he have injured her or incurred her anger the more he thought of the matter the more perplexed he grew as he was debating within himself what action he ought to take there was a knock at the door and a domestic entered handing him a card upon which was inscribed captain joliette ha cried monte cristo he comes in time he will aid me in solving this mystery 
he motioned ali from the study and directed the valet who had brought the card to show the visitor up at once in another instant captain joliette entered the room the count sprang forward to greet him welcome captain said he i have not seen you since our stirring adventures in algeria i hope you are well and happy by the way what are you doing in rome i was not aware you were here i am here simply by chance answered the young soldier with a blush that belied his words i was in italy on a little pleasure trip and naturally drifted to the eternal city i learned only this morning that you were installed at the palazzo costi and instantly hastened to pay my respects when their cordial greetings were over and they were seated side by side upon a commodious sofa luxuriously upholstered in crimson silk the count said abruptly captain did you ever hear of a french opera singer named louise d'armilly again the young man coloured deeply a circumstance that did not escape the close observation of his companion who instantly divined that the famous prima donna counted for more in the reasons that had brought the captain to rome than that gallant warrior was willing to admit yes stammered joliette i have heard of her and report says she is a remarkably charming lady as well as a great artiste your tone is enthusiastic my dear captain returned monte cristo smiling pleasantly perhaps you are acquainted with mademoiselle d'armilly well to confess count said joliette with a laugh i am acquainted with her and curiously enough part of my mission here to-day was to ask you to occupy a box at the performance of lucrezia borgia this evening will you accept with genuine delight was monte cristo's ready answer i desire to see this mysterious prima donna for more than one reason in the first place her name is dimly familiar to me though i cannot remember where i ever heard it and in the second place she flatly refused a visit from me no later than this morning joliette looked greatly surprised refused a visit from you count i would not believe it did i not hear it from your own lips mademoiselle d'armilly must be mad she surely cannot know what an honour it is to receive a visit from the count of monte cristo the count smiled in his peculiar way and handed the captain mademoiselle d'armilly's singular reply to his note the young man glanced at it in amazement reading it again and again finally he stammered out it is her handwriting but what can she mean that is exactly what i would like to know and i see by your manner and words that you are powerless to enlighten me still you can tell me who this mademoiselle d'armilly is and that will in all probability furnish me with the key to her rather shabby treatment of me my dear count i am acquainted with the young lady it is true but like yourself i am in total ignorance so far as her history is concerned she is french that is evident and she has gone so far as to admit to me that louise d'armilly is only her professional name but what her real name is she has more than once positively refused to disclose to me she is equally reticent as to the rumours afloat regarding her you are doubtless aware that she is reputed to be the daughter of a french banker who mysteriously disappeared this she neither denies nor affirms she merely maintains an obstinate silence whenever it is mentioned in her presence your recital interests me greatly captain said monte cristo you are more privileged than myself in that you enjoy the acquaintance of this eccentric young lady but she does not seem to repose a greater degree of confidence in you than in me for she has told you absolutely nothing well said joliette you will see her to-night at any rate despite her prohibition she cannot keep you out of the theatre for the box is purchased and here are the tickets but she will be angry with you captain said the count slyly for bringing such an undesirable auditor i had better go alone and occupy some obscure seat i do not wish you to forfeit mademoiselle d'armilly's smiles for me pshaw replied joliette there is plainly some mistake she does not know you will not recognize you she has certainly confounded you with some one else perhaps so said monte cristo but women's memories are good and i warn you that you are taking a grave risk 
none whatever i assure you it is more than likely that in answering your note as she did mademoiselle d'armilly was influenced solely by caprice if she should ask me after the performance who was my companion i have only to give you a fictitious name and she will be none the wiser that evening captain joliette and the count of monte cristo made their way through the dense throng in front of the apollo theatre and were finally shown into a lower proscenium box commanding a full view of the stage monte cristo instinctively sought refuge behind the curtains and drapery of the box where he could sit unobserved and yet be enabled to closely scrutinize the mysterious singer who appeared to have such an intense aversion for him although still early the house was already crowded in every part and throngs were unable to gain even admission the vast audience was made up chiefly of the best and most fashionable society in rome it included many of the highest nobility who occupied the boxes they held for the season everywhere the bright coloured elegant toilets of the ladies met the eye while the gentlemen were brilliant in fete attire fresh young faces and noble old visages were side by side the beauty of youth and the impressiveness of age and the male countenances were not less striking than those of the females truly it was a grand assemblage one that should delight the heart and flatter the vanity of even the most capricious of prima donnas at first there was a low hum of conversation throughout the theatre together with preliminary visits from box to box but the flutter began to subside as the musicians appeared and by the time they were in their places in the orchestra absolute silence reigned when the conductor made his appearance he was greeted with a burst of applause which he gracefully acknowledged with a profound bow then he grasped his baton tapped lightly upon the rack in front of him and the delightful overture to donna zetti's great work commenced at its conclusion the curtain slowly rose and the opera began mademoiselle d'armilly came forth in due course and the house fairly rung with plaudits of welcome she sang divinely and acted with consummate art receiving loud encores for all her numbers monte cristo who was passionately fond of music caught the prevailing enthusiasm and gradually emerged from the shelter of the protecting curtains and drapery he had scanned mademoiselle d'armilly carefully through his opera-glass and was thoroughly convinced that she was a perfect stranger to him although now and then a tone a gesture or a movement of the body vaguely conveyed a sense of recognition of some tone gesture or movement he had heard or seen somewhere before the count however reflected that all women possessed certain points of resemblance in voice and bearing he therefore passed the present coincidences over as purely accidental thinking no more of them for a long while mademoiselle d'armilly did not glance at the box occupied by captain joliette and the count of monte cristo and it was not until the former threw her a costly wreath of flowers that she turned her eyes in that direction she was about bowing her acknowledgments when her gaze rested upon the stately form of the count instantly she paused in the centre of the stage turned deadly pale beneath the paint of her make-up and with a loud scream fell in a swoon the curtain was at once rung down and the director stating that the prima donna had been seized with sudden and alarming indisposition dismissed the audience captain joliette rushed to mademoiselle d'armilly's dressing-room and the count of monte cristo wended his way back to the palazzo costi utterly bewildered by what had taken place end of chapter one chapter two of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two a strangely sent epistle zuleika monte cristo's daughter had been for some months in the convent school conducted by the sisterhood of the sacred heart she was not a close student though a rapid learner and was rather inclined to romance and adventure than to musty books of history and science as has already been stated she had the early maturity of greek girls besides she had attracted the attention of several roman youths of high and noble lineage 
who had eagerly paid her the homage due to her beauty and oriental attractiveness though but fifteen she appreciated and felt flattered by this homage and naturally was impatient of the restraint put upon her by the regulations of the convent school which rigorously excluded all male visitors save parents or guardians in the first rank of her youthful admirers was the viscount giovanni massetti he was more ardent than any of the rest and indeed was desperately in love with the fair and bewitching child of the dead heyday he belonged to a family of great antiquity and boundless wealth and was reputed to possess a vast fortune in his own right the viscount was only in his twenty-first year but was exceedingly manly dashing and gallant he was quite handsome and was said to be the soul of honour though his ardent temperament and headlong pursuit of whatever he most coveted not unfrequently involved him in serious troubles from which thanks to his own tact and the vast influence of his family he generally came out unscathed on zuleika's arrival in rome and before she had been placed in the convent school the viscount massetti had made her acquaintance in a way that savoured of romance and that made a deep impression upon the inexperienced young girl in monte cristo's carriage attended only by a timid femme de chambre she was one day crossing one of the two bridges leading to the island of san bartolomeo when a trace broke and the horses took fright the terrified driver lost control of them and the mad animals dashed along at a fearful rate almost overturning the carriage zuleika had arisen in the vehicle which was an open barouche and was wildly clinging to the back of the front seat her face white with fear and her long black hair which had become loosened streaming out behind her her wide open eyes had in them a look of tearful supplication most difficult to resist the young viscount who was riding over the bridge on horseback at the time of the accident could not resist it he sprang from his horse and as the carriage passed him leaped into it seizing zuleika by the waist and holding her tightly to him he then made another spring alighting safely with her upon the roadway of the bridge the flying horses were ultimately stopped and the occupants of the badly shattered vehicle rescued from their dangerous situation this adventure caused the count of monte cristo to throw open the doors of his palazzo to the young italian and he had been a frequent visitor there up to the time of zuleika's departure for the convent school in the interval both the viscount and the girl had become much attached to each other and then this mutual attachment had rapidly ripened into mutual love of that ardour and intensity experienced only by children of the southern or oriental sun young massetti had avowed his passion to his beautiful charmer and the avowal had not caused her displeasure it was on the contrary exceedingly agreeable to her and she did not seek to conceal the fact from her enthusiastic suitor the momentous interview took place in a densely shaded alley of the garden of the palazzo costi one sultry afternoon of the early autumn the youthful couple were seated very near each other upon a rustic bench massetti held zuleika's small soft hand in his and the electric touch of her tiny and shapely fingers thrilled him as the touch of female fingers had never thrilled him before he gazed into the liquid depths of her dark glowing eyes and their subtle fires seemed to melt his very soul the close sultry atmosphere laden with heavy intoxicating perfumes was fraught with a delirious influence well calculated to set the blood aflame and promote the explosion of pent-up love the thick green foliage enclosed the pair as in a verdant cloud effectually concealing them from observation the opportunity was irresistible giovanni drew closer to his fascinating companion so closely that her fragrant breath came full in his face utterly subjecting him and totally obliterating all caution everything save his absorbing passion for the palpitating girl whose slight but clear-cut form gracefully outlined beneath her flowing half oriental garments touched his suddenly carried away by a powerful transport he threw his arm around the young girl's yielding waist and drew her without resistance upon his bosom where she lay 
gazing up into his flushed excited countenance with an indescribable voluptuous charm mingled with thorough confidence and unhesitating innocence panting in his clasp her ruby lips partly opened as if for breath and the ardent italian hastily recklessly imprinted a fiery kiss upon them zuleika with an almost imperceptible movement returned this chaste but ravishing salute oh how i love you murmured giovanni quivering from head to foot in his wild ecstasy and clasping the lovely girl still tighter she made no verbal response but did not stir did not strive to extricate herself from his warm embrace this was a sufficient answer for the quick italian zuleika the beautiful zuleika returned his love favored his suit his joy approached delirium oh zuleika he whispered gazing directly into her night-black eyes you love me i am sure give me the treasures of your virgin heart be mine be my wife oh giovanni returned the quivering girl in a low but sweetly modulated voice i do love you god alone knows how much but i am too young to be your wife i am only a child not yet out of school my father would not hear of my marrying for several years to come can you not wait it will be a hard task zuleika answered the young man excitedly but still i will wait if you give me a lover's hope promise to marry me when you are at liberty to do so nay swear it and i shall be satisfied i can neither promise nor swear it giovanni without my father's approval and consent he is a wise experienced and thoughtful man tender and mild to every one he loves though hard and implacable to his enemies speak to him of me of your love of your wish he will listen to you and he will not imperil his daughter's happiness go to him without delay and rest assured that whatever he says or does will be for the best interests of us both she had released herself from his clasp and drawn slightly away from him not in terror not in prudery not in coquetry but as a measure of prudence she felt intuitively that the wild intense passion of her italian adorer must be kept within discreet limits i cannot speak to your father yet replied giovanni hesitatingly he might listen to me it is true but he would treat our love as a mere childish fancy that time could not fail to dim if not obliterate i am deeply in earnest zuleika and could not bear to be treated as a thoughtless headlong stripling who did not know his own mind ridicule even in its mildest form would fire my blood fill me with mad projects of revenge i prefer not to ask your father for your hand until certain of a favourable reception of my suit you comprehend my scruples do you not zuleika i love you too dearly not to win you when i ask but you will speak to my father said the girl in faltering tones yes darling oh yes but not until that hated convent school has ceased to oppose its barriers between us when you have left it when you have completed the education the count designs for you i will seek your father and ask you of him for my wife until then until i can with safety speak at least promise me that you will love no other man encourage no other suitor that i will do responded the girl joyously rest assured i will love no other man encourage no other suitor unable to control himself the viscount again clasped the object of his adoration in his arms and again their lips met in a long passionate kiss of love so it was settled and zuleika went to the convent school of the sacred heart feeling that her happiness was assured but impatient of and dissatisfied with the long delay that must necessarily intervene before the realization of her hopes the dawn of her woman's future the viscount massetti though he had professed himself willing to wait was on his side thoroughly discontented with the arduous task he had undertaken it was one thing to make a rash promise in the heat of enthusiasm but quite another to keep it especially when that promise involved a separation from the lovely girl who had inextricably entwined herself about the fibres of his heart and was the sole guiding star of his life and love the convent school of the sacred heart was located in the convent of that sisterhood about three miles beyond the porta del popolo on the northern side of rome the convent was a spacious edifice but gloomy and forbidding with the aspect of a prison narrow barred windows like those of a dungeon of the middle ages admitted the light from without furnishing a dim restricted illumination that gave but little evidence of the power and brilliancy 
of the orb of day at night the faint sepulchral blaze of candles only served to make the darkness palpable and more ghastly the huge schoolroom was as primitive and comfortless in its appointments and furniture as well could be the walls were of dressed stone and loomed up bare and grisly to a lofty ceiling that was covered with a perfect labyrinth of curiously carved beams the work of some unknown artist of long ago the scholars dormitories were narrow cell-like affairs scantily furnished in which every light must be extinguished at the hour of nine in the evening once admitted to the school the pupils were not permitted to leave its precincts save at vacation or at the termination of their course of studies a circumstance that heartily disgusted the gay light-hearted italian girls sent there to receive both mental and moral training another source of grave vexation to them was the regulation already alluded to that rigorously excluded all male visitors with the exception of parents or guardians attached to the convent was an extensive garden full of huge trees that had apparently stood there for centuries so bent gnarled and aged were they an ancient gardener with a flowing beard as white as snow and scanty locks of the same spotless hue aided by two or three assistants almost as ancient as himself attended to the lawns and vast flower-beds the latter being kept constantly filled with plants of gorgeous bloom and exquisite fragrance the picturesque appearance of the garden contrasted strongly and strangely with the rigid and staid aspect of the convent edifice and this garden was the one spot where the pupils felt at home and thoroughly enjoyed themselves they were allowed to walk there at noon and towards twilight in the evening under the supervision of sister agatha a sharp-sighted and vigilant nun who never failed to rebuke and correct her vivacious charges for even the slightest infraction of discipline still the girls enjoyed themselves in the garden for its extent and the fact that sister agatha could not be everywhere at once enabled the frisky and light-hearted pupils to indulge in many an escapade one noon zuleika who was in an unusually despondent frame of mind strayed from the rest of her companions and strolled beneath the centenarian trees unconsciously she approached the lofty wall of the garden she seated herself at the foot of a gnarled old elm the leafy branches of which descended to the ground and effectually screened monte cristo's daughter from view at least so she thought but though she could not be seen by any within the garden enclosure she was plainly visible from the wall and the trees looming above it without as zuleika sat pondering on her lot and sadly thinking of her separation from her lover she heard or imagined she heard a singular noise amid the thick boughs of an immense chestnut tree immediately outside the garden wall she started up in a fright but could discern nothing unusual and the singular noise was not repeated the strangest part of the whole affair however was that the noise had sounded like her own name uttered by a human voice this increased her terror and confusion and she was about to flee from the spot when an oblong pebble to which something white was attached fluttered over the wall and fell at her feet she was now more alarmed than ever and took several steps backward the while regarding the white object that lay where it had fallen motionless and fascinating finally her curiosity obtained the mastery and approaching the suspicious object with the utmost caution she bent over to examine it it was an ordinary envelope and no doubt contained a letter for whom was it intended obviously for one of the pupils it was a clandestine epistle too otherwise it would have come by the regular channel through the post-office perhaps it was a love-letter at this thought she gave a guilty start and gazed piercingly into the chestnut tree but nothing was visible there save boughs and leaves after all the epistle was doubtless destined for some swarthy visaged italian beauty and many such were in the convent school that it had fallen at her feet was certainly but a mere coincidence it was not it could not be intended for her its rightful owner who had clearly received many similar notes in the same way knew where it was and presently would come for it the envelope had fallen face downward and she could not see the address she touched it with her foot 
then cautiously turned it with the tip of her shoe she saw writing it was the address somehow the arrangement of the characters seemed familiar to her though she was so dazed and confused she could not make out the name her curiosity was unworthy of her she knew unworthy of monte cristo's daughter what right had she to pry into the heart secret of one of her school companions still she gazed she could not help it suddenly she stooped and took the envelope from the ground the address riveted her eyes like a magician's spell great heavens it was her own name zuleika hurriedly snapping the slight string that bound the envelope to the stone she thrust the former into the bosom of her dress then she glanced around her half fearing she had been seen by some of the pupils or the watchful sister agatha but no she was unobserved and even now her companions and the nun were at such a distance that she could read her letter without the slightest danger of being discovered or interrupted the temptation was strong she yielded to it she would read the letter she felt convinced that it was from the viscount massetti and the conviction filled her with unutterable joy she had not heard a word concerning him since she had been immured within the sombre walls of that dismal convent and now she had tidings of him in his own handwriting it was rapture what had he written to her an assurance of his love no doubt and perhaps an exhortation to her to keep her part of their agreement to love no other man to encourage no other suitor surely she loved no one else she never could love any one but giovanni massetti for did he not possess her whole heart all the wealth of her ardent youthful affection she kissed the envelope then opened it took out the letter which was written in pencil and read dearest zuleika i can keep from you no longer i must see you once more and again call you my own i strove to attract your attention just now in the chestnut tree outside the wall i uttered your beloved name but you did not seem to understand me this evening at twilight i will scale the wall at that time be at the elm where you now stand and i will meet you there do not fail me and above all do not be afraid i assure you that no harm can possibly befall either of us meet me darling your own giovanni zuleika stood staring at this passionate note with sensations made up of amazement rapture and dismay giovanni her lover was coming he would stand there on that very spot and she would see him in all the glory of his youthful manhood with the radiant love-light in his eyes but how if he were discovered what then would become of him and of her she shuddered at the possibilities of danger but on one point she was resolved she would meet him let the danger be what it might how giovanni would manage to avoid observation she did not know but she would trust to his judgment and discretion she glanced in the direction of the pupils and sister agatha they were coming slowly towards her again secreting her lover's epistle in her bosom she went to meet them End of chapter two chapter three of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the intruder in the convent garden as the hour for the evening promenade drew near zuleika became painfully excited and uneasy she longed with all her heart to see giovanni massetti again to hear the ardent words of love he would be sure to utter but would she be doing right to meet him clandestinely and alone her mind misgave her of course she could trust her young italian lover for he was the very soul of chivalry and honour but did others know this how would her conduct be judged should the other pupils and sister agatha steal upon them unawares giovanni might escape without recognition but with her it would be altogether different she could escape only by coining an ingenious lie and at that her whole nature revolted she could not stoop to an innocent deception much less to an absolute falsehood why had giovanni tempted her why had he sought to place her in a situation he must know would be perilous there was but one answer because of his love and that answer was sufficient to induce her to take the risk however great it might be yes she would meet him at the appointed time and spot at length the bell rang for the promenade and sister agatha headed the little procession for the garden 
for a brief space zuleika lingered with her companions among the shady walks and gorgeous flowers but at the first opportunity stole away and sought the leafy elm beneath the friendly boughs of which she was to receive the welcome yet dreaded visit from the viscount massetti she gained the rendezvous unobserved with loudly beating heart the young italian was not there she searched eagerly but vainly for him in the gathering twilight what had happened to prevent his coming she was on thorns of anxiety perhaps he had attempted to scale the wall and had fallen sustaining some severe injury perhaps even then while she was waiting for him he was lying outside the wall bruised and bleeding but what could she do only wait wait with torturing thoughts seething in her troubled brain she listened intently not a sound if giovanni were wounded disabled he was maintaining a most heroic silence she drew a magnificent gold watch the exquisite case of which was thickly encrusted with diamonds from her belt and glanced at the dial it was after seven o'clock and by eight all the scholars were required to be safely housed within the convent besides she was not sure that she would not be missed searched for and found what should she do what course should she take as she was debating within herself uncertain whether to remain or return there was a rustle amid the foliage of the chestnut tree immediately outside the garden enclosure and a man's form swung from one of the branches to the top of the wall zuleika's emotion well nigh overcame her she had recognized giovanni in another instant he had leaped from the wall to the ground and was at her side he stretched out his arms to her and the girl all of a tremble impetuously cast herself into them oh giovanni she murmured at last i feared some terrible accident had befallen you i am safe darling zuleika answered the young italian folding her in a close embrace and showering ardent kisses upon her forehead and lips but you dearest you are well you have not forgotten me have not ceased to love me forgotten you ceased to love you giovanni whispered the quivering girl in a tone of slight reproach gazing fondly into his eyes have i not given you my solemn promise to love you only forgive me my own cried the youthful viscount what is a lover without fears and doubts they are the proof of the strength of his adoration they seated themselves at the foot of the branching elm the friendly shelter of which shut them in then zuleika said with apprehension in her voice why did you come here giovanni are you not aware that you are running a great risk and putting me in peril if we are found together you will be ignominiously expelled and i severely punished besides think of the disgrace for us both in such an event the matter will get abroad furnish food for gossip and certainly reach the ears of my father and brother whose displeasure i dread more than all else think too that esperance will call you to account for your conduct and i could never bear a quarrel between you and him in which perhaps blood might be shed never fear zuleika replied massetti gallantly should we be discovered i will shield you as to your father and brother they cannot be displeased for i will explain all to them and end by demanding you in marriage why have i come here simply because i could hold aloof from you no longer i felt that i must see you speak with you renew my vows of love oh zuleika the world is all dark to me without your smile but you promised me to wait i know it but i miscalculated my strength when i made that promise could i see you i might be patient but to wait for weeks and weeks without even a glimpse of your dear face without once hearing the sound of your beloved voice is utterly beyond me i cannot do it you must nothing else can be done my father wishes me to remain at the convent school for a year and the rules positively prohibit your visits be patient yet awhile giovanni we both are very young and have a life of happiness to look forward to besides we can see each other at the palazzo costi during vacation and that is something it is nothing to a man who wishes to see you constantly to be always with you oh zuleika i cannot bear our separation i cannot do without you 
the young man had risen to his feet and uttered these words loudly recklessly zuleika sprang up and caught him by the arm her face white with terror control yourself giovanni control yourself she whispered in a frightened tone speak lower with more caution or other ears than mine will hear you but the viscount did not heed her he was fearfully agitated and his entire frame shook with excitement and emotion fly with me zuleika fly with me now this very moment and be my wife he exclaimed in a voice so strangely altered that monte cristo's daughter scarcely recognized it i am rich and my family has wealth and power sufficient to protect us against everything and everybody even your father with all his untold gold and influence the count of monte cristo seeks to part us that is the reason he has sent you here to this convent where you are little less than a prisoner he caught her wildly in his arms and held her against his breast as if defying fate zuleika more terrified than ever struggled in his embrace and finally released herself she faced giovanni and said warmly you do my father injustice he does not seek to part us he esteems you greatly viscount massetti loves you for the service you rendered me his daughter and will reward that service with the highest recompense in his power to bestow my hand but he considers me a child as yet wishes me to have education and experience before i marry that i may be a wife worth having and not a mere useless doll respect his wishes giovanni respect him he is a good kind-hearted man and will do right his wisdom has been shown too often for me to doubt it his wisdom cried bassetti bitterly yes he is wise too wise to bestow your hand upon me a mere viscount what is my family in his eyes nothing what is my wealth an utter trifle compared to his i tell you zuleika he does not wish us to marry he designed you for some high potentate with riches to match the princely marriage portion you will have no no cried the girl you are despondent and in your despondency misjudge him he cares nothing for wealth or exalted station but values a good name and an unstained reputation above all else but will you not be mine will you not fly with me from this wretched prison in which i can see you only by stealth and like a criminal the italian's eyes sparkled in the twilight and his voice was full of eloquent persuasion he fell upon his knees at zuleika's feet and seizing her hand kissed it passionately again and again the trembling young girl was deeply touched by his love and entreaties for a moment she wavered but for a moment only then reason asserted its sway and cooler reflection came to her aid rise giovanni she said with comparative calmness rise and be a man this proposition is altogether unworthy of you and should i accept it we would both be disgraced i am yours my heart is in your keeping and i will be your wife at the proper time with my father's full consent but i cannot fly with you i will not the young man sprang to his feet as if an electric bat had struck him you have no confidence in me then he cried impulsively you do not love me do not love you exclaimed the girl winding her shapely arms about his neck as her lovely head sank upon his bosom i love you with all my heart with all my soul and it is because i love you that i will not fly with you giovanni kissed her hair rapturously excitedly and the beautiful girl looking ten times more beautiful in her pleading earnestness added sweetly persuasively leave me now darling the bell for the pupils to return to the convent will soon ring and i must not be missed from among them leave me but remember the maxim wait and hope the lover was about to reply when the sound of footsteps suddenly broke upon their ears they glanced at each other startled uncertain what to do giovanni was the first to recover self-possession he noiselessly parted the boughs of the elm and peered cautiously in the direction of the sound three men are rapidly approaching he said hastily in a whisper they are almost here zuleika looked in her turn through the branches the gardener and his assistants she whispered nearly petrified by consternation they have evidently learned that you scaled the wall and are in quest of you see said giovanni breathlessly pointing to a group behind the men a number of nuns are also coming they are searching for me o oh, giovanni fly fly instantly and leave you to suffer to bear the weight of my imprudence never i will stay and protect you you will not protect me by remaining you will only compromise us both the more go i beseech you go while there is yet time 
with tears in her imploring eyes zuleika pushed her lover gently towards the wall he gazed at her for an instant and then at the approaching men and nuns who were now very near the girl clasped her hands supplicatingly then mutely pointed to the wall it is your wish asked massetti hurriedly zuleika nodded her head affirmatively and still more imperatively pointed to the wall i will obey you whispered the young italian and i will wait and hope she had gained the victory a joyous love-light came into her eyes for the moment eclipsing her terror giovanni could not resist the temptation to embrace her even in the face of the danger that threatened him he wound his arms about her yielding form drew her to him with a crushing strain showering burning kisses upon her upturned lips farewell he murmured reluctantly releasing her farewell my own he turned from her and ran to the wall scaled it with the agility of a cat and vanished when the gardener and his assistants reached the elm they found zuleika standing there alone had they seen massetti scale the wall had they recognized him these thoughts shot through the girl's agitated mind she gave no attention to her own peril the men came to a halt and stood silently by waiting for the nuns to arrive horror was pictured on their aged countenances and they stared at monte cristo's daughter as if she had committed some heinous unpardonable crime the group of nuns speedily arrived headed by sister agatha who held an open letter in her hand zuleika gazed at this letter in silent dismay it was hers the one giovanni had written her how had it got into sister agatha's possession she mechanically felt in her bosom where she had secreted it as she thought safely her hand touched only the empty envelope the note must have fallen upon the floor of the schoolroom and been found by some malicious pupil who after reading it and discovering its compromising contents had surrendered it to the nun thus divulging the weighty secret zuleika stood abashed and terror-stricken no chance of escape now no chance for deception had she wished to essay it the letter told the whole story and the proof of its truth was furnished for was she not at the appointed rendezvous and was it not probable that the men and the nuns had seen giovanni quit her and scale the garden wall the nuns looked as horrified as the old servants but they were more to be dreaded they possessed the power of reprimanding and punishing and what punishment would they think too severe in this extreme case sister agatha spoke her tone was milder than zuleika had expected oh mademoiselle she said reproachfully what is this a meeting with a lover and within these holy precincts dedicated to celibacy chastity and sacred things what will your father the count of monte cristo say when your conduct is reported to him you are young and allowance must be made for youthful blood and passionate impulses but still you have done wrong very wrong is this man who signs himself giovanni and who just left you your betrothed he is murmured zuleika blushing and holding down her head with your father's permission mademoiselle my father does not object to him replied the girl evasively in that case your fault is not so great as i at first supposed said the nun you are pardonable for receiving the man who with your father's consent is in time to become your husband but nevertheless in meeting him within the convent grounds you are censurable for lack of discipline and also for conniving at a breach of our rule which excludes all male visitors save parents or guardians zuleika bowed her head in submission the punishment continued sister agatha shall be as light as possible however if you have never before met this man within the convent grounds i have never met him here before said zuleika and only met him in this instance because because she hesitated and burst into tears because what my poor child asked the nun kindly because i love him so and because i was afraid if i did not meet him in his desperation he would seek me out in face of you all have you ever written to him since you have been in this school never has he ever written to you before you hold his first letter to me in your hand how was this letter delivered by what means did it reach you her face one mass of crimson trembling from head to foot zuleika told the whole story of her adventure at noon that day how she had strayed from her companions without any definite intention how she had seated herself within the screening branches of the elm to meditate how she had heard the singular noise in the chestnut tree and finally how the letter fastened to a stone had come fluttering over the wall and fallen at her feet the nuns glanced at each other horrified and amazed at the audacity of the young italian zuleika said sister agatha i told you your punishment should be as light as possible you have been exposed and reprimanded 
the blush of shame has been brought to your cheek this i think is penalty sufficient for a first offence considering also that it was in a measure forced upon you but beware of a second infraction of our rules now return to your companions so it happened that zuleika suffered but slightly for the imprudence and headlong devotion of her lover fearing gossip the sisterhood of the sacred harp suppressed the matter and the count of monte cristo never heard of it zuleika expected ridicule from her companions but the warm-blooded romantic italian girls instead of ridiculing her looked upon her as a heroine and envied her the possession of a lover daring and devoted enough to scale the wall of a convent garden End of chapter three chapter four of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four a stormy interview when captain joliette entered the dressing-room of mademoiselle d'armilly after quitting the count of monte cristo at the apollo theatre on the sudden termination of the performance of lucrezia borgia he found the prima donna lying upon a sofa and slowly recovering from the effects of her swoon her maid and the ladies of the company the latter still in their stage attire were giving her every attention it was a strange and somewhat grotesque scene a real drama with theatrical surroundings the blazing lights enclosed by their wire spheres threw a ruddy glare upon the faces of those present making them appear weird and witch-like in their paint and powder on chairs and tables lay mademoiselle d'armilly's changes of dress for the performance and her street garments while upon a broad shelf in front of a mirror were the various mysterious articles used in her make-up rouge grease paint poudre de riz etc together with brushes and numerous camel's hair pencils a basin filled with water stood on a washstand and on the floor was the pitcher in company with a heterogeneous collection of stage and street boots belonging to the eminent songstress the director of the theatre was standing anxiously beside the suffering prima donna mentally calculating the chances of her ability to appear the following night leon d'armilly was walking back and forth in the small apartment wringing his hands and shedding tears like a woman while at the open door lounged the tenor and baritone of the troupe their countenances wearing the usual listless expression of veteran opera singers who from long habit are thoroughly accustomed to the indispositions and caprices of prima donnas and consider them as incidental to the profession as captain joliette came in leon ran to him and exclaimed amid his tears oh how could you bring that odious man to your box see how the very sight of him has affected my poor sister at these words mademoiselle d'armilly roused herself and springing to her feet faced the young soldier in a fit of uncontrollable rage how dare you she cried her eyes flashing and her voice tremulous with anger come here to me after what has occurred to-night i was not aware louise answered he apologetically that you had such a terrible aversion to the count of monte cristo the count of monte cristo exclaimed the director was he in the house this evening what an honour the irate prima donna flashed upon him a terrible glance if you consider it an honour to have that monster in your theatre she fairly hissed i will sing for you no more the humiliated director walked away without making a reply he deemed it the part of wisdom not to embroil himself with an eminent artiste who was capable of bringing him in so much money and who also was capable he thought of breaking her engagement if she saw fit to do so he therefore left the dressing-room the others seeing that mademoiselle d'armilly was evidently about to have a hot dispute with her admirer and that she was sufficiently restored to need no further care also quitted the apartment when they were alone the prima donna turned fiercely upon the captain exclaiming and you profess to love me too was it love that induced you to bring my worst enemy here to-night it was hatred rather 
captain joliette you hate me you know i do not louise said the young soldier warmly you know i love you to desperation why then was the so-called count of monte cristo in your box i was not aware that you knew him indeed i felt convinced that he was a total stranger to you and his conduct to-night tended to confirm that conviction he looked at you without the slightest sign of recognition and so far from being your enemy is he that he gave you louder and more enthusiastic applause than any other man in the entire theatre it is his art captain joliette i tell you that man is as cunning as a serpent and as remorseless as a tiger only this morning he sought to gain access to me with what iniquitous motive i know not but i returned his letter with an answer that must have galled his pride to the quick i saw that answer said the captain monte cristo showed it to me himself at his residence the palazzo costi what cried mademoiselle d'armilly with augmented anger you saw it read my very words and yet brought him to your box listen louise and be reasonable he told me that your name seemed familiar to him and yet he could not recall where or under what circumstances he had heard it he was astonished at the tone of your reply to his formal and i must say very civil note i was sure there must be some mistake on your part that you had confounded him with some other person i had gone to the palazzo costi expressly to invite him to hear you sing to have such a great man present and assist at your triumph i felt proud of you louise proud of you as an artiste and as a woman and i wanted my friend of friends to share my exalted appreciation of you such were the reasons that induced me to bring him to my box to-night and surely if i committed an error i deserve pardon for my motives i will never pardon you be your motives what they may cried mademoiselle d'armilly vindictively his presence ruined the performance and disgraced me me louise d'armilly in the eyes of all rome the captain stood speechless appalled by her fury white with rage her eyes flashing and her bosom heaving she looked like some beautiful demon i would have triumphed as usual had he not been here she continued furiously and bitterly and to-morrow the eternal city would have been at my feet i would have been an acknowledged queen nay even greater than any sovereign alive but now i have failed and am nothing captain joliette for all this you are to blame and yet you think you deserve pardon for your motives why man you are worse than an idiot no i will never pardon you never she strode about the dressing-room as she spoke her small white hands working as if ready to tear the young soldier to pieces joliette watched her for an instant and then said you are a singular creature louise a problem that i must admit i cannot solve what is the count of monte cristo to you that you swoon at the mere sight of him you certainly could not have been in any way associated with his past life have suffered from the signal vengeance he took upon his enemies years ago mademoiselle d'armilly paused suddenly in her excited walk and seizing the captain by the arm with so strong a clutch that a thrill of pain shot through him cried menacingly if you dare to mention monte cristo's fiendish vengeance to me again i will banish you for ever from my presence at that moment one of the officials of the theatre appeared at the dressing-room door a note for mademoiselle said he bowing profoundly the prima donna took the missive from the man and glanced at the address upon the envelope as she did so she knitted her brows and cried out his handwriting another insult i will not read it the official withdrew in confusion whose handwriting asked joliette his curiosity and jealousy simultaneously excited mademoiselle d'armilly had frequently referred to her numerous admirers and the letters she received from them and the captain naturally jumped to the conclusion that this note had been sent by some ardent roman suitor he considered the artiste's exclamation and assumption of displeasure as mere artful tricks designed to deceive him whose handwriting 
repeated mademoiselle d'armilly scornfully must i explain everything to you the young man had borne all his companion in her anger had heaped upon him with comparative equanimity but he could not bear the idea of a rival the very thought was torture louise he pleaded let me see that letter let me read it what must you needs examine my private correspondence captain joliette you are going too far you have done enough to-night without adding insult to injury i do not seek to injure you louise god knows neither do i wish to insult you but that letter i must and will read you talk as if i were already your wife and slave adopt another and less authoritative tone monsieur captain joliette you are not yet my husband would that i were and were sure of your love louise the continual uncertainty in which you keep me is insupportable you refuse to let me read that letter the young man in his turn began to pace the dressing-room excitedly his jealous suspicions growing stronger and stronger mademoiselle d'armilly gazed at him triumphantly she was proud of the vast influence she exercised over this brave and manly warrior he would stand unmoved before the cannon's mouth but she could make him quail and tremble you refuse to let me read that letter he repeated what if i do not refuse said she in a softer tone you will make me a very happy man then read it for i will not thus i show my contempt for its miserable and cowardly author she crumpled the note in her hand and cast it on the floor then she placed her foot upon it joliette stooped and took it from beneath her boot he straightened out the envelope opened it removed the missive and read as follows the count of monte cristo presents his respects to mademoiselle d'armilly and begs leave to express his deep regret that his presence in captain joliette's box was the cause of such a grave catastrophe he is utterly at a loss to realize why mademoiselle d'armilly should entertain so profound an aversion for him and why the sight of him should so seriously affect her if mademoiselle d'armilly would condescend to explain he would regard it as a special favor he trusts that captain joliette will in no wise be blamed for what has occurred as that gentleman when he invited the count to share his box was as thoroughly convinced as the count himself that mademoiselle d'armilly did not know and would not recognize him as joliette read the last lines that so completely cleared him he could not suppress an exclamation of joy louise he cried the count of monte cristo has written to exculpate me indeed replied the prima donna contemptuously yes he also apologizes to you and asks you to explain why the sight of him so seriously affects you he asks an explanation does he cried mademoiselle d'armilly her anger resuming sway he shall never have one but you will pardon me as you see i am altogether blameless i will hold your pardon under advisement captain my action towards you will be greatly influenced by your future conduct in regard to the wretch who calls himself monte cristo you surely do not wish me to cast him off to shun him do you prefer him to me i love you louise love you better than anything or anybody else in the whole world but i greatly esteem the count of monte cristo there are ties between us that you do not understand i do not care to understand them i have told you that this man is my enemy that should be sufficient for you my lover and my enemy cannot be friends choose between us would you have me quarrel with him quarrel with him yes and not only that i would have you fight him kill him the young man stood aghast he was totally unprepared for this explosion this savage vindictive demand fight him kill him louise you cannot you do not mean what you say am i in the habit of using idle words louise louise i entreat you do not impose such horrible conditions upon me are you afraid of monte cristo i am afraid of no man living louise but i cannot challenge monte cristo to a duel even for you then you refuse to protect to champion me oh louise how can you speak thus i would gladly shed every drop of blood in my veins for you gladly lay down my life for you but do not ask me to lift a hand against the count of monte cristo 
the beautiful woman looked at the energetic speaker haughtily and discontentedly she was not a little disappointed she had thought her influence over her suitor unbounded but now it appeared that it had its limits she however did not despair well knowing the wonderful fascination she possessed for men she determined to bring all its batteries to bear upon captain joliette she was bent on wreaking a terrible vengeance upon the count of monte cristo for some mysterious injury he had inflicted on her in the past an injury in regard to which she refused to be communicative even to her accepted lover and was resolved that joliette should give the highest proof of his devotion to her by becoming the instrument of that vengeance with the shrewdness of an experienced woman of the world she readily saw that a special effort would be required on her part to bend the gallant soldier to her will and compel him to execute her inexorable purpose she would make that special effort and in making it would render herself so captivating so enticing so desirable that joliette could not fail to be intoxicated with her charms and fascinations then under the mad sway of his blind passion excited to the utmost he would be ready to do anything for her anything even to the commission of a crime even to shedding the blood of his dearest friend at this juncture mademoiselle d'armilly turning from the captain as if in high displeasure for it was an important part of her plan to assume a certain degree of coldness towards him at first touched a bell and immediately her brother leon and her maid appeared franchette she said addressing the latter assist me with my street toilet i have sufficiently recovered to return to the hotel de france unmindful of the presence of the captain and leon the designing prima donna at once began to remove the costume she had worn during the opera the maid aided her in this operation with the outward impassibility of theatrical servants though she imperceptibly smiled as she realized that this display of her mistress's personal charms was made solely for the purpose of rendering the young soldier still more the slave of that artful siren as mademoiselle d'armilly stood in her corset and clinging skirts of spotless white that delicately outlined her faultless shape her fine throat shoulders and arms displaying their glowing brilliancy captain joliette gazed at her like one entranced never in all his life he thought had he looked upon a woman so thoroughly beautiful so goddess-like she was as perfect as a painting of venus and a thousand times more lovely for being alive he held his breath as he saw her bosom palpitate and felt that he would give all he possessed in the world to call her his own to be with her for ever leon seemed somewhat abashed by his sister's proceeding and blushed like a girl the crimson tide giving his countenance a beauty altogether feminine the toilet operation completed mademoiselle d'armilly surveyed herself triumphantly in the mirror she was well aware that she had riveted her chains very tightly upon her lover but for all that she could tell only by actual experiment if he were sufficiently under her dominion to accede to her wishes concerning the count of monte cristo hence she determined to make that experiment without delay ere cool reflection had come to the dazzled warrior's aid and enabled him to realize that a trap had been laid for him quitting the mirror she went to captain joliette's side and placing her hand on his arm as she threw into his eyes all the magnetism of her glance said in a dulcet tone will you accompany me to the hotel captain the young man joyously assented and soon an elegant equipage was bearing him swiftly towards the prima donna's apartments End of chapter four chapter five of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter v annunziata solara it was a bright warm afternoon in spring and the piazza del popolo 
rome's great promenade was crowded with gay pleasure-seekers of both sexes while the corso and the two other principal thoroughfares diverging from this extensive public square were also thronged with young and old the trees were covered with fresh green foliage and multitudes of blooming flowers adorned the piazza and the windows of the adjacent palaces and humble dwellings sounds of joy and mirth were heard on every side while now and then strains of soft music were audible it was truly a most inspiring scene of light and life flirtations were frequent between beautiful dark-visaged girls with hair and eyes like night in their picturesque attire and manly-looking youthful gallants while here and there sullen and sombre glances spoke of jealousy as fierce as fire hinting of marital vengeance and love tragedies characteristic of the hot-blooded impetuous italians in the midst of the throng on the piazza two youths were strolling arm in arm they were the viscount giovanni massetti and esperance the son of monte cristo fast friends they seemed and gaily they chatted as they passed leisurely along their spirits were in full harmony with the animated scene around them and they were evidently not insensible to the charms of the many pretty maidens they encountered and upon whom they cast admiring glances suddenly a peasant girl of dazzling beauty appeared in the piazza very near them she was apparently about seventeen glowing with sturdy health her full cheeks the hue of the red rose her sleeves rolled above the elbows displayed perfect arms that would have been the envy of a sculptor her feet were bare and her short skirts afforded dazzling glimpses of finely turned ankles and limbs of almost faultless form her face had a cheery and agreeable expression not unmixed with piquant archness and a sort of dainty bewitching coquetry she was a flower-girl and was vending bouquets from a basket jauntily borne on one arm she addressed herself glibly to the young men she met offering her wares so demurely and modestly that she seldom failed in finding appreciation and liberal customers there was not even a suspicion of boldness or sauciness about her but she had that entire self-possession engendered by thorough familiarity with her somewhat risky and perilous vocation giovanni and esperance caught sight of her simultaneously both were struck by her appearance and demeanour to which her gaudy but neat and clean peasant costume gave additional eclat what a handsome girl exclaimed esperance involuntarily a divinity replied the viscount excitedly then they glanced at each other and laughed evidently rather ashamed of the admiration they had so enthusiastically expressed her first words however will scatter the allusion to the winds said esperance cynically she is no doubt as ignorant as she is pretty quite likely rejoined giovanni the outside beauty of these peasant girls generally conceals much internal coarseness not to say depravity they were about pursuing their way when the girl advanced offering them her bouquets her voice was so sweet so melodious so deliciously modulated that the young men paused in spite of themselves she stood in a most graceful attitude her parted coral lips exhibiting teeth as white and glittering as pearls a subtle magnetism seemed to exhale from her that was not without its influence upon the two youths besides her words did not betoken that ignorance alluded to by esperance or that depravity the viscount had spoken of buy some bouquets for your fair sweethearts signors she said they will gladden their hearts for the perfume speaks of love love exclaimed giovanni smiling at her earnestness and poetic language what do you know of love ah signor she answered blushing deeply and averting her eyes what girl does not know of love even the meanest peasant feels the error of the little blind god the young men were amused and interested though belonging to the lower class this poor flower-girl had certainly received some education and was endowed with a fair share of the finer feelings 
espérance felt attracted towards her and giovanni experienced a fascination not difficult to account for separated from zuleika filled with a lover's despair the ardent viscount was not averse to a little flirtation more or less innocent here was his opportunity he would cultivate this romantic and handsome girl's acquaintance where was the harm he did not design being unfaithful to zuleika and this piquant peasant would be none the worse for brightening some of his sad hours no doubt she was accessible and would welcome such a diversion especially as he would pour gold liberally into her lap i will buy some flowers of you my girl he said encouragingly here is a beautiful bouquet signor said the girl smiling joyously at the prospect of making a profitable sale and handing him a magnificent selection of fragrant buds and bloom giovanni took the bouquet and at the same time gently pressed the girl's taper fingers they were soft and velvety to his touch a delightful thrill shot through him at the contact the flower-girl evinced no displeasure clearly she was accustomed to such advances the viscount slipped a gold coin of considerable value into her hand again experiencing the delightful thrill this is too much signor said the girl looking at the coin and i have not the change you must wait a moment until i get it never mind the change answered giovanni keep the whole the girl looked astonished at such liberality then a joyous smile overspread her beautiful visage oh thank you thank you ever so much signor she said effusively the colour deepening on her tempting cheeks giovanni with difficulty restrained himself from kissing them what is your name my girl he asked as she moved to depart annunziata solaro signor she replied surprised that such a question should be asked her where do you live in the country just beyond the trastavere do you live alone no with my father pasquale solara what is his occupation he is a shepherd signor the girl bowed to the two young men and with a glance at giovanni that set his blood tingling in his veins passed on and was speedily lost in the throng of promenaders espérance who had watched this scene with amused curiosity broke into a hearty laugh as the viscount turned towards him with something very like a sigh giovanni said he the pretty annunziata solara has bewitched you not quite so much as that espérance replied the young italian but she is a glorious creature isn't she yes as far as looks go but all is not gold that glitters and this fair annunziata may turn out a perfect fiend or fury upon a closer acquaintance giovanni gave his friend a glance of reproach do not insult her with such wretched insinuations he replied warmly espérance smiled and said you are smitten with her that's plain i am not but i admire her as i would anything beautiful put it as you please at any rate you will hardly be likely to see her again she was a vision and has faded but i do not intend to lose sight of her you do not mean to say that you design seeking her out that is exactly what i mean to say espérance looked at his friend quizzically and at the same time uneasily when do you design seeking her out this very night in the trastevere no you did not hear her aright she said she lived in the country just beyond the trastevere i will seek her there what alone alone beware giovanni her bright eyes may lead you into danger how do you know that she has not some fierce brigand lover who will meet you with a stiletto nonsense your fears are childish i am not so sure of that the country beyond the trastevere is infested by daring robbers who would not hesitate to seize you and hold you for a ransom only the other day the notorious luigi vampa performed just such an exploit exacting a very large sum for the release of his prisoner who was a wealthy nobleman like yourself i will take the chances you are mad i am not i have no fear of brigands they would not dare to lay even a finger upon a massetti the young viscount drew himself up proudly as he spoke he believed the power of his family invincible espérance was at a total loss to understand the firm hold 
this sudden infatuation had taken upon his friend of course he fully comprehended the influence of female beauty over hot headstrong youth and he acknowledged to himself that annunziata was really very beautiful and alluring still she was not more so than hosts of other girls who would be glad to win a smile from the viscount massetti at almost any price and whose pursuit would be altogether unattended with danger it was well known that the shrewd brigands frequently sent handsome young women to rome to entice their prey to them and might not annunziata solara with all her apparent demureness be one of those dangerous delilahs after several further attempts to dissuade the viscount from the rash venture he had decided upon making all of which were vain espérance resolved that his impetuous friend should not go alone that night in quest of the fascinating annunziata he would follow him unseen and endeavour to protect him should the necessity arise he knew the viscount's nature too thoroughly to propose accompanying him as such a proposition would undoubtedly be received with scorn if not as an absolute insult he would however keep track of him and if all went well massetti would be none the wiser if on the contrary his aid should be needed he could come forward and give it in that event gratitude on the viscount's part would prevent him from demanding an explanation of his presence meanwhile the young men had continued their stroll and had passed from the piazza del popolo to the corso giovanni was taciturn and moody he looked straight ahead failing to notice the gaily attired beauties thronging that great thoroughfare who at ordinary times would have engrossed his attention not so with esperance he admired the vivacious ladies on the sidewalk or in their handsome carriages drawn by spirited horses now and then he recognized an acquaintance among them and bowed but giovanni recognized no one he seemed plunged in a reverie that nothing could break scarcely did he reply to esperance's occasional remarks and when he did so it was with the air of a man whose thoughts are far away at the broad portico of the magnificent palazzo massetti esperance the son of monte cristo bade his friend farewell as he turned to depart he said is your determination still unaltered do you yet intend to seek annunziata solaro in the country beyond the trastevere giovanni glanced at him keenly as he replied somewhat impatiently my determination is unaltered i shall seek her to-night to-night Esperance said nothing further but departed full of sad forebodings he felt a premonition of evil and was certain that his infatuated friend would meet with some dire mishap during the romantic and hazardous expedition of that night it was now quite late and the young man hurriedly bent his steps towards the palazzo costi maturing his plan as he walked along he would inform the count of monte cristo that he had been invited to accompany some friends on a pleasure excursion requesting his permission to absent himself from rome for a few days this permission obtained he would assume the garb of an italian peasant make his way to the ponte sant angelo and there in the shadow of the bridge await the coming of the viscount massetti when the latter had passed his place of concealment he would follow him at a distance keeping him in view and watching him closely monte cristo made no objection to his son's proposed absence and the young man after a hasty supper hurried to his sleeping-chamber where he soon assumed a peasant's dress he had worn at a recent masquerade stepping in front of a toilet mirror he applied a stain to his face giving it the colour of that of a sunburnt tiller of the fields when his disguise was completed he surveyed himself triumphantly in the glass even his father could not have recognized him so radically had he altered his appearance gaining the street by a private door without being observed he was speedily at the bridge as he stepped into the shadow of one of the abutments he heard the great clock of the vatican strike seven it was twilight but everything around him was as plainly visible as in broad day he glanced in every direction no sign of giovanni had the ardent young viscount already crossed the tiber he thought not and waited patiently for a quarter of an hour still no sign then he began to grow anxious massetti had certainly passed over the bridge and he had missed him he waited a few minutes longer devoured by impatience and anxiety at last he reached the conclusion that giovanni had preceded him had gone on alone unprotected 
he must have done so otherwise he would certainly have appeared ere this the thought was torture to what unknown what deadly perils was he exposing himself amid the marshes without the city walls but perhaps he had not yet left the city walls behind him a ray of hope came to esperance if massetti were still within the limits of the trastevere he might by using due speed overtake him he would make the attempt at any rate as he formed this resolution he emerged from the shadow of the abutment at that instant a man came upon the bridge and passed him he passed so closely that they almost touched uttering a suppressed oath at finding an intruder in his path his pace was rapid so rapid that he was soon far away he had not even looked at esperance and it seemed to the latter that he had endeavoured to conceal his face the man was of giovanni's size and had giovanni's bearing but there the resemblance ended he was certainly a peasant his attire betokened it besides his countenance of which esperance had caught a glimpse was rough and tanned the son of monte cristo felt a pang of keen disappointment then he glanced at his own garments thought of his own stained visage and a revelation came to him like a flash of lightning the man was giovanni giovanni in disguise he hurriedly looked after his retiring figure it was now but a mere speck in the distance scarcely discernible in the fading twilight he started swiftly in pursuit almost running across the bridge after a hot and weary chase he at length gained so much on the object of his solicitude that he was as near as he deemed it prudent to approach he was now sure that the man ahead of him was the viscount massetti esperance paused a second to recover his breath then he went on at a slower pace the pursued had not discovered the pursuit he trudged along steadily and sturdily never once looking back thus the two men crossed the trastevere and each in turn emerging from a gate in the wall of the leonine city passed out into the marshy country beyond they had not gone very far when esperance saw giovanni suddenly give a start at the same time he heard a loud harsh voice cry out in the name of luigi vampa halt straining his eyes esperance finally succeeded in piercing the semi-darkness of the surroundings and perceived a gigantic ruffian who wore a black mask standing in the centre of the road and presenting a pistol at the head of the man he had every reason to believe was giovanni massetti end of chapter five chapter six of monte cristo's daughter by edmund flagg this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the power of a name the young viscount for it was indeed he whom the gigantic masked brigand had halted was staggered for an instant by this unlooked-for interruption of his journey in pursuit of the beautiful flower-girl he gazed at the huge ruffian in front of him first in bewilderment and then in anger the robber calmly continued to cover him with his pistol as giovanni made a movement with his hand towards a stiletto he wore at the belt of his peasant's dress the man's quick eye detected his intention and he exclaimed in a rough tone of command touch that stiletto and i will blow your brains out the viscount dropped his hand he was as brave as a lion but the bandit had the advantage of him and courageous as he was he instantly recognized the folly of disregarding his warning his rage and indignation however were too great for him to control he cried to his stalwart adversary why do you stop a poor peasant from whom you can obtain nothing you are not a poor peasant signor i am not eh well search me and see you are neither a poor peasant signor nor any peasant at all i have seen you too often in rome to be deceived by the flimsy disguise you wear so unnaturally i know you you are the viscount giovanni massetti well what if i am retorted the young man sharply the fact will not benefit you or any member of your accursed and cowardly band have a care how you talk signor exclaimed the bandit threateningly insolence to your captors may cost you more than you would be willing to pay indeed yes i mean exactly what i say it may cost you your life 
giovanni glared at the brigand with unflinching eyes he returned threat for threat take my life if you will he said it would be the worst piece of work you have ever done may i ask why signor it would raise my family against you and the result could not fail to be your extermination the man laughed loudly and caustically replied you are joking what can your family do against luigi vampa and his comrades who have long been countenanced by the highest authority this was the climax of insult and giovanni driven to the highest pitch of fury unable longer to control himself tore his stiletto from its sheath and raising it aloft made a frantic dash at the gigantic brigand instantly the latter fired giovanni dropped his weapon his right arm fell useless at his side esperance meanwhile had not been idle his excitement was intense and with it was mingled terrible fear for the safety of his friend nevertheless he eventually succeeded in sufficiently calming and collecting himself to form a plan of action and put it in execution he had provided himself with a pistol which he had freshly charged prior to his departure from the palazzo costi he drew this weapon from its place of concealment at the first intimation of danger noiselessly cocking it the road was skirted with tall thick bushes from which projected a fringe of heavy shadows along this dark fringe esperance stole with cautious tread towards the huge bandit as soon as he perceived him standing in the centre of the highway and noted his threatening attitude as he stealthily advanced the moon suddenly rose flooding the scene with its silvery light its rays however did not disturb the line of skirting shadows and esperance passed on unseen when the brigand fired he was very near him seeing giovanni's arm fall and realizing that he was wounded the son of monte cristo promptly raised his weapon and covering the gigantic ruffian discharged it directly at his heart blood gushed from the man's breast he sank to the ground where he lay quivering convulsively in another instant he expired without even uttering a groan giovanni whose arm was badly shattered and who was suffering frightful pain stood speechless with amazement at this sudden unexpected intervention in his favour esperance instantly sprang to his side the young italian stared at him as if he had been an apparition from the other world he failed to recognise him in his peasant's dress with his stained visage who are you he gasped as soon as he was able to find words do you not know me asked esperance astonished in his excitement he had forgotten his disguise you are a stranger to me replied the viscount but my gratitude is none the less on that account you have rescued me from captivity perhaps saved my life i am no stranger giovanni i am your friend esperance what esperance in that dress with that sunburnt countenance i thought your voice had a strangely familiar sound but your disguise proved too complete for me to penetrate it these words recalled to the mind of the son of monte cristo the changes he had made in his appearance no wonder that viscount had failed to recognize him why did you disguise yourself and how came you here at this critical juncture demanded giovanni after a pause i disguised myself that i might follow you without fear of detection you would not listen to reason and i determined to protect you during your rash adventure so far as might lie in my power from the bottom of my heart i thank you esperance you are a brave as well as a devoted friend fully worthy of your illustrious father but how did you know me i too am disguised the fact of my own disguise enabled me to penetrate yours i recognized you almost immediately after you passed me on the ponte st angelo what were you the peasant i nearly ran down as i crossed the bridge i was but let us lose no more time we have lost enough already besides more of luigi vampa's band are probably prowling in the vicinity and i imagine we both have had sufficient of the banditti for one night 
prudence dictates that we should return at once to rome with your shattered arm you surely do not count upon continuing your search for the fair annunziata at present no that is impossible i regret to say i will return with you to rome as the viscount spoke a sudden tremor seized upon him and he leaned on his friend's shoulder for support you are faint from loss of blood exclaimed espérance much alarmed how thoughtless in me not to bind up your wound taking his handkerchief from his pocket he wiped the blood from his friend's arm carefully tenderly bandaging the hurt then he made a sling of giovanni's handkerchief placing the wounded member in it the viscount felt easier thus though still somewhat faint you are quite a physician espérance said he not at all replied the son of monte cristo but my father taught me how to manage hurts he said the knowledge would at some time be useful to me and his words have proved true your father is a wonderful man he seems to think of everything to provide for all contingencies thanks to the skill he imparted to you i am now in a condition to start on the homeward journey the young men turned their faces towards rome but scarcely had they taken a dozen steps when the road in front of them literally swarmed with rough-looking armed men who effectually barred their progress in an instant they were surrounded resistance was impossible the two friends glanced at each other and about them in dismay the newcomers were evidently bandits members of luigi vampa's desperate band one of the miscreants who appeared to be the leader and was very picturesquely attired confronted giovanni and espérance he had a pistol in his belt but did not draw it you are my prisoners said he in a tone of authority who are you and by what right do you detain us demanded espérance haughtily who i am replied the brigand in a stern voice does not concern you the right by which i detain you is the right of the strongest we cannot oppose your will however unreasonable and unjust returned espérance my friend is wounded and my pistol is discharged we can only throw ourselves upon your mercy but we are gentlemen in spite of our dress and demand to be treated as such how came your friend to be wounded and your pistol discharged asked the bandit suspiciously my friend was attacked and i went to his assistance answered espérance you were in a fight then resumed the leader turning suddenly to his men he asked where is ludovico he went up the road half an hour since and has not yet returned answered a short thick-set young fellow who seemed to be the leader's lieutenant just like him said the leader always rash always seeking adventures alone i heard a pistol shot some time back he continued looking menacingly at espérance perhaps ludovico has been assassinated if so it shall go hard with his murderers let him be searched for the short thick-set lieutenant accompanied by several of the band immediately departed to obey the order espérance glanced anxiously at giovanni a new danger threatened them the gigantic brigand who had been slain was without doubt this ludovico his body would be found and summary vengeance taken upon them giovanni also realized the additional peril but neither of the young men gave the slightest evidence of fear inwardly they resolved to face death stoically to meet it without the quiver of a muscle in a brief space the lieutenant and his companions returned two of the men bore the corpse of the huge robber they placed it on the grass by the roadside where the full moonlight streamed upon it showing the wound in the breast and the garments saturated with blood a frown contracted the leader's visage he glanced at espérance and the viscount with a look of hate and rage then turning to the lieutenant he said well we found ludovico lying in the road a little distance from here replied the short thick-set man with a trace of emotion in his rough voice he was shot in the heart and had been dead for some time the brigands had gathered about the prostrate form of their comrade they seemed to be much affected by his fate ludovico was evidently a favourite as soon as the leader had received his subordinate's report he turned to the prisoners asking sternly which of you murdered this man 
no murder was committed returned espérance indignantly the huge ruffian shot my friend shattering his arm as you see he was killed as a measure of defence your pistol is discharged continued the leader harshly that you have admitted you killed ludovico i defended my friend whom he had basely attacked said espérance sullenly you killed this man yes or no i killed him enough cried the leader grinding his teeth you shall pay the penalty of your crime both of you shall die he motioned to his lieutenant and in an instant espérance and giovanni were securely bound the young men read desperate resolution and fierce vengeance upon all the rough countenances around them there was not the faintest glimmer of hope death would be dealt out to them at once and in the most summary fashion indeed nooses were already dangling from a couple of trees by the roadside waiting to do their fell work the sight of these dread preparations roused giovanni with flashing eyes he faced the leader of the band beware he cried if you murder us you will have all rome to deal with we have told you we are gentlemen and not peasants i am the viscount giovanni massetti and my companion is the son of the famous count of monte cristo as the young italian uttered these words a newcomer suddenly appeared upon the scene for whom all the rest made way he was an intellectual-looking man unostentatiously attired in a peasant's garb who spoke the name of the count of monte cristo demanded he the leader silently pointed to massetti who instantly replied i spoke the name of the count of monte cristo and he will surely take bitter vengeance upon you all for the murder of his son his son yes his son who stands here at my side ignobly bound and menaced with a shameful death the stranger turned to espérance and examined him closely are you the son of monte cristo he asked visibly agitated i am answered espérance coldly give me some token wait and hope his maxim ah you recognize it do you also recognize this as he spoke the young man held up his left hand and a magnificent diamond ring he wore flashed in the moonlight the newcomer took his hand and glanced at the jewel one that the count of monte cristo had worn for years and which he had but a few days before presented to his son i am convinced said the stranger then turning to the leader he said in a tone of command release these men but they have slain ludovico release them thundered the stranger ludovico should have known better than to have interfered with my friends he was instantly obeyed and the two young men greatly astonished stood relieved of their bonds you are at liberty continued the stranger and can resume your route say to the count of monte cristo that luigi vampa remembers his compact and is faithful to it as he spoke the notorious bandit chief gathered his men together and the whole band vanished among the trees like so many spirits of the night End of chapter six